Um, welcome everybody to this LinkedIn Live. Um, I'm joined here by Caitlin Ringrose and Chris Wood um, talking about a recent report done by FPF and LGBT Tech on safeguarding sexual orientation and gender identity information and the privacy risks um, and potential harms associated with processing that information. Uh, my name is Amy Stepanovich. I am the VP of Policy at the Future Privacy Forum. Um, I'm going to immediately turn over to um, these two amazing experts who I'm with. Can you both um, say a bit about who you are, what your background is, um, and what you work on in this space? Chris, you want to go first? Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> right. Hey, y'all. I'm Caitlin Ringrose. I'm Google's policy lead for law enforcement and government access, but probably more importantly for this call, I am a former Future of Privacy Forum Christopher Wolf Diversity Law Fellow, uh, which is where I got to work with Chris Wood and LGBT Tech on this report. And we had so much fun doing it. Um, my name is Christopher Wood. I'm the executive director and co-founder of LGBT Tech. I'm really focused at the intersection of the LGBTQ community and technology, uh, exploring the benefits and challenges for the community um, across the United States and around the globe. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so I joined FPF in January and this report was already um, so far along and had such great information in it. Um, I want to turn to the two of you. How did this report come about and why was it so important when you started it and why might it even be more important maybe today as it was published? So I'll be honest, uh, the way this started, so the, with LGBT Tech and uh, Future Privacy Forum, we've been working in and around each other for many years, um, always having very interesting conversations about data, the use of data. Um, but in particular, uh, this particular topic came up before COVID um, and really thinking about the LGBTQ community and the data that was being collected around the LGBTQ community and how it was being used, not just negatively, but also positively or not being used because of the fears of, of what it could potentially do. And so in conversations with Jules Polinsky, the executive director of FPF, we really started looking at and exploring the ways that we could begin looking at SOGI data and the benefits, the uses, and really put that out in a report that would be beneficial not only to the nonprofit community, but also policymakers, companies, and so forth. And that's where I was uh, introduced to Caitlin Ringrose. Yeah, of course. Um, no, I think that's a perfect overview. COVID really spurred a lot of this work and a lot of this attention. Um, and Amy, the report would not be where it is without your thoughtful guidance. And it honestly, it looks it looks very different. It's updated. It's so much um, better than it was when, when I left FPF. Um, I will say too, a lot of FPF's historical work on privacy harms was really foundational for us. FPF put out in 2017 an infographic called the Privacy Harms Chart. Basically, that um, from the perspective of the majority or just a hypothetical person looked into what would happen if some of your most personal information were to be made available to certain individuals in your lives. Um, so for some people, that could mean a loss in employment, a loss in friendships, uh, reputational harms, for example. Um, when Chris and I started looking at this issue, though, we really started thinking about how those harms are magnified for certain persons. And so for LGBTQ individuals in particular, it could be a loss in their family structures. It could be carceral harms. And then there can even be harms um, that, are, that are so great, they're left off the 2017 chart entirely, which could include a loss of life. So right now in 70 countries around the world, same-sex behaviors and LGBTQ identities are criminalized, and in a dozen, um, those crimes can be met with punishment of death. So I think that I and everyone working on this report really capitalized on the work that FPF had already done and the expertise that LGBT tech brought to this to think about how to make it more salient for LGBTQ plus communities and our allies. Pretty great. Chris, before I just exited myself from the production, um, you had said a couple of the audiences that you had been writing for when you started in on the report and people you were targeting this to. 
Um, now that it's out, who would you say this is really for? Um, who are the audiences that you think really need to read this? Um, and are there any particular ways you think it should be used by those audiences? And that might change depending on who you're targeting it to. I think it's important to recognize that we do not currently have a federal privacy legislation. And so therefore, when that happens in the United States, you have states that start picking up uh, where we fall short and uh, where the federal government's falling short. And so what we've seen is a patchwork of federal privacy legislations, which are not necessarily handling or taking into account the specific needs of the LGBT community. So when we're talking about who is this for, first and foremost, in the immediacy, it's for the states that are trying to pass this, while federally, it's also for, for legislators in Congress to be looking at and understanding how privacy legislation needs to be for all, including the LGBT community, um, which it makes up a huge portion of uh, individuals here in the United States. I think also it's really important for companies to be paying attention to this report because they're collecting the data or using the data in particular ways, but not just for, you know, when we, a lot of times in the news we're hearing about companies and data and it's all negative, but I think it's important to recognize, and we will probably hit on this in a little bit, is the LGBTQ community is one of the most understudied marginalized communities for a multitude of reasons, which I'll expand on. But with that understudied portion of the population, it's much harder to serve them. And so it's rather than turning around and telling companies, you have to delete this data, you shouldn't collect this data, this data is not appropriate. It's more about safeguarding the data. And this is true across the board. Um, and so anyone that is working with data or has is trying to legislate around data. It's important for individuals to understand what portions of data might be sensitive, what portions of data might be sensitive for the LGBTQ community specifically, and how can they implement rules within their companies or policies with you know, in the state or federal levels that can protect these individuals while still allowing the opportunity for research and continued uh, exploration of how technology, technologies can benefit the LGBTQ community. Chris, that was amazing. I have to underscore everything you just said was, was perfect. Um, so totally on point. Uh, and the report really calls out explicitly organizations and policymakers as being these greatest change makers, right? Um, Chris, like you said, it's individuals who have the data, they have this great responsibility, and they can act change on, on such a broad scale so quickly. Um, there's so much work that goes into how individuals can access the tools they need to protect themselves. When we're talking about privacy, it's always, you know, use this certain system or, or use this setting, et cetera. Um, but I think it's really fantastic that we put the focus or the onus and the burden on those who, who really can do the most and can do the most um, right away. So the report does those, you know, five recommendations or encourages those five recommendations. It encourages actors like organizations and policymakers to recognize the sensitivity of this data, to inventory and classify it to the extent possible, to evaluate protections for SOGI information, support efforts to promote inclusion, representation, equity, and prevent discrimination, and also support and encourage additional research. So overall, if this report does, does any of that or encourages any of those actors to take those steps, I would consider it a job well done. I also think it's great that it's continuing to catalyze conversations like this. Um, I would love to see it being cited in additional research, even if that research says, hey, this was helpful, but it just really uh, is, is a, a start. One of the things I really was moved by in this report, um, even in the early drafts, was the long history that it details of ways that um, privacy has been denied to LGBTQ um, individuals and communities. And I learned so much um, from reading, um, helping research. It was just a wealth of information um, that got included. And I'm wondering, is there anything that either of you learned writing the report um, that have stuck with you? Any 
one or two or even more things that you've just taken into your life or absorbed that you might not have known before? Yeah, I feel like we all became kind of mini historians after this paper. And Chris, I feel like this is your favorite part too. You're always like, oh, I found this, this new research or I watch this new film. Um, and so it's interesting. Uh, and in one way we can frame it as historical harms. In another way, we can say it's it's something that's you know continuing to, to bleed into the world today. Um, these harms are still occurring. They might have morphed. They might have changed with the digitization of information, but they're still very much around us and in our culture. Um, so for me, I thought most interesting in the report was our description of the lavender scare, which was this period between 1940 to 1975, where the U.S. federal government really purged federal civil workforce or the, the workforce of LGBTQ workers, right? Um, either those who already identified as LGBTQ or whom the federal government merely had a suspicion of engaging in certain behaviors. And so it was called the Lavender Scare because it was around the same time as the fears around communism and those were really coupled together. Um, of interest to me in particular was J. Edgar Hoover's role and the role of the FBI in promoting surveillance in the time, um, really trying to, to find individuals who they considered a threat to the security of the nation and unfit for government service, which included military service too. I'm a person who works on surveillance issues. I happen to live right next door to J. Edgar Hoover's grave. Um, where ironically enough, he is buried next to many queer individuals who are in the military whom he so uh, targeted and despised. So the idea that the FBI had this kind of sexual deviance program was to me, frankly, sickening. Um, but like I said, it's important not to think of this as something that's rooted in history. We do have today a number of don't say gay bills in the U.S., and we even have the U.S. Supreme Court challenging traditional notions of privacy. So with these, these challenges to precedent, LGBTQ individuals in our communities are imperiled alongside all people in the U.S. And I think especially us, because we rely on the court to enshrine our protections to not just reproductive health care privacy, but our right to marry who we choose, be in a relationship with whom we choose, and also our right to privacy just in our bedroom overall. And so, you know, when we're thinking about how harms move through history, it's important to note that today we have court cases, we have legislation, we have social harms that are continuing to impact us. Absolutely, I'm uh, I'm a huge history buff, um, as if uh, or, or just information gatherer. And so this was really uh, an amazing opportunity to dive deeper into some of this, and especially through COVID, when we all had a lot of time on our hands. Um, and uh, you know, now out on like Discovery Plus, you've got uh, the Book of Queer, which is diving into a lot of these stories, these really deep rooted stories. One that I really wasn't aware of was um, the the right to be let alone, uh, which is from a case in 1890, uh, Warren and Brandeis, um, which was really focused in on um, talking about invasive uh, spying on a particular family member who may have been a bit more effeminate um, and trying to expose, uh, expose them. And so really in thinking about the LGBTQ community and the fact that you know, we think about data. Um, data didn't just start in the era of computers. Data has been used for many years. Data was used to target certain bars, to uh, out people in newspapers, to, but also all the way back to, you know, back when individuals in 1890 were trying to, you know, live their life in maybe more major cities. Um, and we were, uh, we were, we were chased and, and you know a lot of times prosecuted for that um, based on laws that were in the books. And so thinking about that case back in 1890 and that I didn't know it um, as a gay man, uh, I think continued to make me want to dig deeper into the ways that our privacy was impacted, affected before the things that we really know, like Stonewall and um, you know some of the others. I think it's really important to recognize that Stonewall was the the tipping point. That was the tipping point where we were so angry about this, so angry about continuously being 
harassed and uh, information being used against us. That wasn't the start. The start was much earlier than that. And the start was the build up to that point of that tipping point. So I think really digging into those areas where we may not know a lot about, and I think there's still a lot more research we can do, will help us understand as researchers, as those representing nonprofit organizations and whole communities, but also for policymakers and companies to make the best decisions about how best to protect data in the future so that hopefully we're not learning from the past, but more looking to the future by learning the past. Um, so that's really, it, it, it's been an incredible journey through this, and I, I know there's so much more to do. And of course, that report is available both through um, LGBT Tech and at the FPF website um, at the link that's being shown um, on the screen. Anybody who's tuning in now, if you have questions for Caitlin and Chris um, on the report or on this issue, please um, feel free to put them in and, and we'll get to those as we go through, continue to go through this conversation. Um, I want to dig into uh, the harms um, in the report. You know, Caitlin, you've talked about this a little bit um, and the work that had been done leading up to the report or, or kind of feeding into the report on harms. Um, the report spends time not only on those harms um, that data processing can cause to individuals and communities, um, but also the benefits of that data use. Chris, you've talked about this. So you have both sides of it. It's, it's what data can give and, and the harm it can cause. Are there instances um, where you think LGBT individuals or communities have been denied benefits because of the absence of data, um, where maybe harm has come from, from not being able to um, access or not having the data collected about those communities? Um, and, but, and what caveats should institutions maybe take on if they want to try to use data in this way? It's something that we get to a bit in the report, but maybe um, exploring where those two intersections come together. Yeah, I think, of course, more resources and more research into things like the digital divide and homelessness issues facing LGBTQ youth who are substantially more likely to be homeless than their, than their um, straight or straight presenting peers. Um, and of course, Chris mentioned COVID and health crises that LGBTQ individuals face. Um, not just COVID, but from the HIV AIDS pandemic and all the way un until now where we have um, monkeypox being used to, to villainize LGBTQ individuals and associate people with disease. LGBTQ folks face stigma and that's often centered around their health status. Uh, today, just very recently, we have a number of guidance coming out from organizations like GLAAD basically censuring uh, press organizations from spreading misinformation about how, how disease moves through communities, noting that, um, that it's important to focus on facts and not on people, and really pushing the fact that public health officials and the media needs to promote true information. And they can't do that without having that information and having done that research. And so it's it's everything. It's from how, how healthy we are, how we access the internet, how we find uh, new relationships, and also um, how, how our children experience home lives, right? All of that can be made better by, by research, by resources, but also by um, a, a degree of care and understanding of those issues that might come about through research, but I would also argue too that it's something that we need to um, address foundationally. We need to ensure that as a nation, we're caring about uh, everyone and not just leaving folks um, to fall between the cracks. I, I completely agree with everything that Caitlin said and, and oftentimes what came up, I mean, I think one of the most most powerful conversations I had was really early in, in the foundation of, of forming LGBT tech, and that was with Christopher Wolf, um, the other founder of FPF, and talking about the, the benefits of having data and the benefits of having data to help a community, because when you have more information, you have more data points, as long as they're being used by the right people and when they're being used appropriately, you can actually save a lot more lives, you can help uh, individuals uh, access better healthcare, find housing, employment, support services. 
you know, on and on and on. There's been a lot of reports coming out about the fact that LGBTQ individuals are staying in uh, in rural communities um, more, but yet we don't necessarily know how they're accessing LGBTQ specific services. How is their health care? Um, what are some of the, the issues that they're facing? I also look at um, where we've gone through different administrations or we've gone through different you know places in in history where uh, the LGBTQ community has been erased from a lot of things. There's there's even in, in the formation, since the formation of LGBT tech, we've seen information that was worked on uh, within government ag agencies um, that has been completely erased or completely disappears, um, even though it's extremely important and helpful and actually counts an entire portion of the population and their specific needs. And so regardless, regardless of anyone's political view, at the end of the day, we're all people and we're all people who live in, uh, in the same country who are in need of specific services. And the more research that we have when it's used appropriately and when we're, we're using data to go ahead and help people, then we are actually creating a better operating community. We're creating an, a society where we can actually help each other. Um, and so it's really important to, to not just throw the baby out with the bathwater, for lack of better words, but really look at how do we safeguard this data? How do we ensure that individuals are ensuring that SOGI data and, and whatever that data may be is protected in a particular way, either through legislation or by companies taking the right actions, um, because that's important. Um, for a long time, we've seen where the absence of data also means that it's easier to deny the existence of the entire community, which we know to date um, is not true. And actually, uh, in fact, every single time that we're able to collect more information about individuals living in different parts of the country, what we're finding is that there's actually more LGBTQ individuals than we originally thought. So I think that's important to be thinking about um, as we are continuing to explore this, continuing to write legislative bills federally that protect privacy, and as companies are looking at, at safeguarding their data and doing right by not only their customers, but the communities that they serve. I want to stick on this um, for another question, Chris. You talk about um, organizations protecting that data when they take it in to make sure that it's not used in certain ways. And I always get drawn back into this story of the U.S. Census. Um, we just went through a census. We know the importance of it. It gets drilled into the entire populace every 10 years um, in creating metrics, measuring populations, et cetera. Um, the list goes on and on. So you, we we're told the importance of participating. Uh, but we also know that this past census, there were some efforts to include certain questions that were met with great resistance um, from advocacy groups and communities. And historically, we also know that the census was one source of information used, um, for example, during World War II to put individuals in internment camps um, and other really um, feed really harmful um, activities by the US government. And so maybe what are steps as we look toward um, the recent Dobbs decision and what might be coming out of the Supreme Court in the future where uh, maybe some of the rights that individuals have and luckily have been recently recognized by the judicial system, that recognition might get rolled back. What are some things that we might be um, needing to discuss around specifically protecting um, data when it's collected? Because as you very eloquently laid out, we can't ignore or, or delete or remove um, evidence of these populations. Um, this is a really hard question, um, and I thank you for it. Um, because in, you know, on one side, I see the the power of the data, and I see the importance of it. Um, I I think as as we're enshrining federal privacy laws into into existence. Um, but even before that, as companies are looking at, at the use of data, um, I think companies have, are, are at the forefront of this and can really protect their consumers and ensuring that they're not exposing data that isn't um, isn't absolutely necessary. And I think that's kind of step one. And, and from companies really ensuring that they're being transparent about their practices and talking about why they're doing, why they're putting certain things in places is really key. I think that within the federal government, um, 
we need to rely on our uh, not our appointed positions, but our career life life career individuals who are in the government to really help put some of these things in place. And hopefully Congress will get there in a way that will include LGBTQ as well as other marginalized communities to protect them and not harm them. Um, I, I continuously worry about areas where sexual orientation and gender identity information or that even those words, sexual orientation and gender identity are left out of a bill just so it can be passed through the Senate, which is, it is okay in one way. I can see that with like the IA, IAJA, um, the Jobs Act, where there was maybe some portions where it could have been included, but then it goes to the agencies to begin figuring out. And so, what I would do in that case is, from the federal government perspective, if if you're not seeing sexual orientation or gender identity spelled out in a particular bill, um, what I ask you to do as an agency and as leaders of that agency is to make sure that as you're implementing those things that you are including sexual orientation and gender identity as a protected area, especially if your uh, commission or the formation of your agency implores you to serve all members of the United States, all residents of the United States, then you have, I really feel, deep down that you have the power to then protect all all residents of the United States within within your bellywick. Um, and so I think that there's there's a lot of different ways that we can uh, we can work on this. I'm I'm I sit on several committees for um, the FCC and work with the FTC and this is one area that I'm continuing to push because as Caitlin has said and as Amy you know very well and we've talked about is is we don't have full protections right now um, necessarily, and they are under threat in, in many different ways, but there are ways that we can begin to figure out how to protect ourselves because there's enough people in the United States, there's enough people that support things like marriage, support, um, you know, uh, support all kinds of different marginalized communities that we have the opportunity to go ahead and protect these communities in a way that um, that we others may not. It's not that's not a perfect answer, Amy. I, I know we've got a lot of work to do, and I, it's it's a little bit rocky right now. But there are some things coming up. There's a federal privacy bill that I know is I think being uh, voted on today, um, um, or being talked about today in the news. And so there's opportunities to really engage and push there. And these reports are important. I will also say that more information is important. And so the more research, and as this report calls out, the more research we can do, uh, the ensuring that individuals know that the LGBTQ community and, and the data behind it is important, continuing to dig into that and continuing to report on various different communities within the LGBTQ community and ensuring that we can support them the best way possible. Yeah, and I've heard that from you, Chris, from Carlos. The LGBTQ community is not a monolith. We need to make sure when we're when we're doing our research and we're looking at data um, that it's coming from that particular point of view. Um, Amy, I'm glad you brought up the census. I looked up while we were chatting how long the census has been running, and it's 230 odd years old, which is just absolutely wild. Um, so obviously, it's great that it's growing and it's looking. Um, at how many Americans identify as LGBTQ and things like the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on those people. Um, but it's also imperative that the census paves a path toward privacy protections for those who, who it surveys. Um, that's why it's so great that they adopted differential privacy recently. And it's one of the things we promote in our report around trying to make sure um, that if you're collecting identifiable data in, in research, for research like the census does, um, that you employ de-identification methods whenever possible. Um, and then there's also another great FPF report on DID, it's a de-identification chart, um, which might come in handy there. So I think we, we have a question um, from Gloria um, asking if either of you have thoughts about the work of Kevin Guyen, um, I'm definitely pronouncing that wrong with my apologies, um, precisely about the issues that we are currently discussing, um, referencing his book, Queer Data. Um, if you have had a chance to read that or any of those other resources. I haven't. Um, I came prepared with like a few books that I thought are awesome to recommend at the end of this. Um, but now I'm also going to buy Kevin's book. That's a really good shout out. I'm always looking for, for new things to read. I will say the amount of information we consume for this report is wild. I actually use our um, 
our resources all the time. And so it's really helpful to be able to, to build off of that. But, but thank you for the question. Chris, have you, have you read that? Or are you reading anything good now to recommend too? Um, I have not read that book, uh, but now I know that I, now that I'm done with six weeks of travel, I know that I have a, a book to go ahead and read. Um, thank you so much for that. I, I, I do really appreciate it. We have definitely, a lot of times we've talked to um, several uh, academics that are in this space and looking at it from a, from through a very queer lens, as well as um, I've, I have the opportunity to work with a lot of STEAM professionals or STEM professionals that are in this space and maybe doing research or maybe on the more academic side. And I will say that there are some really brilliant minds thinking about this from an academic perspective. And I think the most important thing that as, as NGOs and those that are really looking at at how it impacts on, on the daily lives of LGBTQ. It's really translating the, that academic research and putting it into practice uh, as it relates to, to the federal government or the state legislators and in making sure that that translation is, is made really clear in a way that's actually going to help the LGBTQ community. So um, I look forward to diving into that. And if you would like to talk to me more about it um, as we get to it, please lgbttech.org. Um, reach out through our contact and my team will definitely put you in contact with me um, to, to go ahead and, and continue to have that conversation because you just gave me summer homework. I want to actually dig into this a little. Um, Caitlin, you've been tweeting some of the people who helped um, get involved and inspire and um, consult on this report. Um, you just mentioned how much research went into this. Chris, I know that um, you have a lot of folks in the space. Caitlin, you held up books by Professor Scott Skinner Thompson, um, a former colleague of mine at Colorado Law School, writing Privacy at the Margins, a big fan. Um, and Ruha Benjamin um, as well was the other book you held up. Who are the, the people um, who you'd maybe like to thank before we go on to the next question or you thought were pretty um, instrumental, great resources as, as you went through on your research? So we did a little bit of thank yous in the report itself, and I do not think that that was enough. Um, we stood on the shoulders of giants to write this report. We we shamelessly quoted them and, and threw them uh, their work into into our citations. Um, but I think overall, you know, we're talking about supporting researchers. It's important to to buy their books, to attend their talks, and to make sure. Um, that, that we're putting their names in our mouths as much as possible. So thanks so much, Amy, um, for the opportunity to do that. I think Professor Benjamin's book, Professor Skinner Thompson's books are fantastic. I do want to mention um, Oz Keys, too, wrote Body Instrumental, which is fantastic about the harms of gender recognition and AI systems. Uh, Joe Jerome's work on VR, AR. Anna Higgins' um, continued focus on these particular topics has been fantastic. Um, and so overall, I think there's great academic interest in this topic. And the more that, that we can do, and maybe organizations can do too, to, to tap some of these external experts, um, it is better. <clears throat> Yeah, I think from the beginning we set out, like I remember having this conversation with you, Caitlin, because we set out on this journey to figure out what this paper was going to look like. And it got really broad, really fast. And we realized that there was absolutely no way we could tackle this um, and, and actually get a report out in a meaningful amount of time with the small amount of group, you know, work team that we had. And so um, I will say we looked at a lot of different points and we looked at in, in a lot of different areas and diving deeper into the subsets subsections of the lgbtq community so um you know if you're reading this report and you're watching this i hope you i hope you understand our goal was to open the conversation and to dive deeper and i think that this is probably just the beginning uh, of many conversations that are going to take place from this or i hope it is and many areas of interest of which we're going to take uh take and continue to dive into research for this. So if you're watching this, you, you are conducting research um, or you're looking into this um, in a particular way, we welcome the outreach because we are looking to dive deeper into these different areas and continue to explore them. Uh, before I go to our next um, viewer question, um, I also wanna add a name. Um, Professor Anna Lauren Hoffman was one of the people who introduced me to a lot of these issues. She gave 
an amazing talk um, at our SA, that's O-U-R-S-A a few years ago, which was an alternative conference um, organized to the RSA Security Conference in San Francisco and really helped open my eyes to some, my personal eyes to some of these issues. Um, and I'm really grateful for that introduction. Um, so we do have a viewer question from Kier. The ADPPA, and I don't like necessarily relying on acronyms. So for those who don't know, that is the American Data Privacy and Protection Act that is currently being maybe right now or just recently um, voted on um, in the House Senate, um, the House Commerce Committee. Um, it has gone through several different versions. Um, I know that very well because I know the team here has um, helped to redline many of those versions. Um, and in those versions, the language has changed to classify sexual orientation as a sensitive data category and to include in non-discrimination provisions. Um, that language has gone from sexual orientation, sex, sexual behavior. In your mind, coming from this statutory language perspective, is any of those terms more or less um, inclusive or stronger than any of the other terms? It's a good question. Um, I saw similar language in Washington Privacy Act around uh, covered data insofar as sensitive data. Just, just to kind of set the stage here, sensitive data under a lot of these privacy laws is one subsect of personal information. It can afford individuals greater protections. It might impose certain obligations on companies that aren't there for, for other data types like your name, um, or, or maybe your business address, et cetera. Um, so the inclusion of, of so-called SOGI data in this list is actually really helpful. Um, it, it makes sure that LGBTQ persons are represented in um, addition to things like race and ethnicity that is often included under sen uh, sensitive information. It also borrows from the GDPR's Article 9 quite a bit. Um, here, to your question, those are three different kinds of, of data, at least in my mind. An individual sexual orientation might mean who they're attracted to, sometimes who they sleep with, maybe not. Um, a person's sex can, can be their biological sex, it can be their gender identity, oftentimes in things like the court case Bostock, for example, we did see that gender identity identity was codified as sex. And then things like sexual behavior, a lot of folks think that that's the same as sexual orientation, but it's really not. Um, there are people who um, consider themselves a, a man who has sex with men, for example, but maybe not gay or bisexual. And so it is important that we recognize each of these terms as different and covering different classes of persons and data, affording them greater protections. Chris, before you chime in, um, maybe one thing, like, would you say, based on Caitlin's description, like sexual behavior, because recently we saw sexual orientation scrapped and it was um, replaced just with the term sexual behavior. Is that totally or slightly separate as a category in the Venn diagram or maybe a broader circle that includes sexual orientation, would you say? I would say that uh, sexual behavior is a separate diagram, I believe, in the fact that it's, as Caitlin described, there are communities of men who identify as straight, but have are you know men who have sex with men, or identify as man who, uh, men who have sex with men but not gay, um, and and so I think it's really important to recognize, as Caitlin underscored, those three very different definitions, and I was. Just quickly, you know, pulling up some of the things, because a lot of times when we're working on bills on the federal or state level, the most important thing that we can do is use language that is has already been codified into law. And so we are really, you know, in, in a lot of the bills that we have worked on are using sexual orientation uh, is the term that is used when identifying or really working through uh, amongst an entire list, longer list of uh, gender identity and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, in typical LGBTQ bills, what we've seen is the use of the word sexual orientation, but I don't think it fully describes, um, and just because it's been codified into law before, doesn't mean that we can't add, you know, add new terms into law now. I just think to Caitlin and Amy's point, it's important that we are 
clearly describing what we are talking about because it can mean very different things, um, especially especially using the word sex. I don't think that would throw me off in a bill. If I was reading that, that would make me think of uh, not anything to do really with the, the LGBTQ community, but more the sex of a person um, and whether, you know, but then it would go to like biological sex or, uh, you know, I, identifying sex. Um, so it just, I think there's really, um, I think we need to be very careful about terms. And if we are going to use them, that they're clearly described uh, in the bills um, and defined in the bills. Yeah, I think that's right. And then too, Amy, on the flip side of the question is whether sexual behavior is an umbrella term that covers sexual identity. Um, it's absolutely not. There are individuals in the queer community like myself, a bisexual woman in a monogamous relationship with a straight man. I still identify as queer, as bisexual. It doesn't really have to do necessarily with my sexual behavior. There's so many folks in this community, like Chris always says, it's not a monolith um, that we need to consider here. So, so striking terms in favor of others, it's important to have open conversations like this, but before doing so. Wonderful. I hope um, we have some congressional staff members tuning in who could hear um, both of your answers to that question. Um, so again, any of the people who are tuning in, viewing, watching this on LinkedIn, please do give us your questions. We have about 17 and a half minutes left um, of this conversation, um, which will not be enough time, um, given just what we have heard and what we've been able to discuss so far. Um, I do want to turn back to the report. Caitlin, you discussed early on that there are five key recommendations that kind of round out the report directed at organizations. Um, if you had um, the executive of a company, um, big company, small company, like ghost figure standing next to you um, right now, um, hologram, maybe, I guess, it will, will make it an immersive experience. Um, what is the thing that you would say that they could do tomorrow that might show a meaningful commitment to dr addressing the issues that are raised in the report, um, maybe other than actually just reading the report, um, which I hope is, a, is the first thing that they're going to do. Yeah, of course. Um, if you're watching this now, read the report for sure. Uh, I also see too often that companies rely on impacted individuals who are already, you know, struggling in this world that often doesn't respect them or their rights to, to do this work, to engage in this research, to bring them solutions. Uh, and that's just too burdensome, right? Um, hire and invest in the folks, even externally, who are already doing this work, who are experts in the space. Uh, you're a, a CEO, you maybe have resources. You also don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, like Chris has mentioned, there may be no federal comprehensive privacy law, but you can uh, undertake your own practices. You can borrow best practices from others and from orgs like FPF, frankly, that have them there ready for you to use. You can implement those on your own time. You could start doing it tomorrow. And you can also look inward at yourself and your own workforce. I think all too often, too, we talk about being a welcoming um, place for new hires, encouraging new folks to get into the, the field, especially the tech field, but we forget to look um, at our existing workforce, uh, folks who um, come to work every day and are feeling like maybe they're not supported and, and their contributions aren't, aren't supported either. So I would say, you know, outside of this privacy conversation overall, make sure you're respecting your, your own workers and your own internal leadership. Um, so yeah, so in short, I think read the report, make sure that you're relying on external and internal expertise as much as possible, but also not overly burdening folks who already struggle with these issues. Uh, and then despite, you know, everything going on the, on the world, take care um, of, of the folks who, who work in your organization. I can underscore everything Caitlin is saying. I would say, you know, also read the report and also take the time to really think through the ways that your particular business or your work is impacting a marginalized community specifically. Um, you know, as Caitlin said, don't put the burden on those who may 
uh, identify with a particular community, um, you know, to come up with all the answers, but also it's it's sometimes also really helpful just to ask questions and just to listen, um, or just of interest, not to implement um, and learn. Uh, ask questions of LGBTQ leaders. Uh, feel free to reach out to me um, or any of the others that you're in touch with. I think it's important to recognize that the current landscape of the United States, uh, and, and in particular state by state, because there are over 300 anti-LGBTQ bills across the country right now, um, but also recognize, especially in the tech fields, that uh, technology really doesn't know borders. Um, a lot of technology uh, is outside of the United States as well. So understanding the landscape of the world and think about the data that you're collecting. How is it being used for the benefit of the company? How is it being used for the benefit of the communities in which you're trying to reach and serve? I think we just came out of we just came out of uh, June and Pride Month, where I think I was home for a total of six days in, in the month of June. Um, and but I will say that uh, all too often it's like you know the corporate shingles go up for Pride and you know look beautiful and their logos change, and then we leave Pride and you know that all goes away. But it's really important to make sure that we're thinking about it all year round. We're thinking about the intersectionalities and that we're thinking about um, how not only the data we're collecting to use for the companies, but how can we use that data to actually help the communities in which we're trying to reach. Um, and think of, turn this on its head and how do you how do you create a company? How are you doing things within your company that are innovative, unique, different, um, that really put your money where your mouth is and say, not only are we going to try to cater to this community, not only are we going to hire individuals from this community, ensure that they're represented inside the community, inside our company at all levels, including our board, but how are we also ensuring that we're giving back to the communities in which we rely on so much? Um, I recognize it's hard for smaller companies as well, but I think if you're baking it in from the beginning and you're thinking about that from the very beginning, uh, then your company has a higher chance of succeeding because you're being inclusive from the ground up. Um, and then just being um, <clears throat> being sensitive about, I, I've heard most recently with some of these decisions coming down is like, okay, we're just gonna delete all this data. We don't wanna have, we don't want to be in, you know, in trouble for using it. You know, there, we're hearing about some decisions that may come down from certain, uh, you know, certain overseers of data that are saying, "Don't keep this data." That can also be detrimental because one of the highest users of LGBTQ data um, are nonprofit organizations that are trying to reach their communities. So when you go and you delete data, and we can't reach our communities, then it becomes really hard. And then it goes to my earlier point of. If we don't have the data, then it's almost like we don't exist. So just be careful and think through what you're doing there. It's better to safeguard and protect that data, de-identify that data as Caitlin recommended um, before just going out and deleting it. Um, so that, those are kind of my points to add to Caitlin's already really good points. So you both have worked in the privacy space. I imagine you, like myself, have heard countless times maybe more times than you can count. Um, why why do people care about privacy if they have nothing to hide? Um, kind of the, the thought that this isn't a big deal to certain people, um, which I've always thought of as a very privileged argument. And maybe in this context, more than any other context, um, that argument might be able to be made. So I'm wondering if you might have a message to people in this conversation um, above all others when they say, I have nothing to hide, um, what that might mean in, in the privacy space. It's the worst, the, the absolute worst statement ever. Um, it reminds me of like the post-World War II poem, you know, then they came for me, there was no one left to speak out for me. Um, I agree that it's incredibly privileged. I hear this from people who maybe don't have bodies or identities that have been um, over-policed, surveilled, had their speech or activities chilled. Maybe um, individuals who, who really haven't felt that from, from their government, from their community, et cetera. I never hear this from people who um, ha have suffered these harms because of their race or their religion or their LGBTQ status. I would also ask those people that even if you're not worried for yourself, even if the poem doesn't speak to you, um, where is where is your allyship and wh where is your empathy 
Um, Chris said earlier that um, if we erase this data or absence of data about LGBTQ persons, it makes it easier to deny that they exist. Um, and I would say that this kind of sentiment also um, it is a denial that individuals who do have reasonable fears about intrusion exist. I agree. It, it is a very privileged uh, perspective to come from. Um, and that comes from probably one of the most, uh, I'm not quite because I identify as gay, but I realize I'm a white gay cis male, which comes with a whole lot of privilege uh, in this country. And so it's important to recognize, first and foremost, is if, if you are saying that in, even in your head, I think it's important that you really think about and read and listen to individuals that don't look like you, that have not had the experiences that you've had because so many in the LGBTQ community, just creating the programs that we have, the Power On program, which distributes technology to LGBTQ individuals, the PADS program, which is listening to LGBTQ or empowering LGBTQ individuals to tell their story about getting into STEM fields, when you start listening to uh, LGBTQ community members who um, are, are not in the monolith, but I, that span many marginalized communities, all of a sudden you start to realize just the uphill battle that so many of them have had to face, keeping in mind that it's LGBTQ individuals as a marginalized community are some of, is some of the only marginalized communities that can face discrimination in their own biological home. And so keeping in that mind in your most, you know, as a youth, in your youngest stage, most one of your most vulnerable stages for the success of your entire life. And this comes from a, a guy who's a, also a foster parent. And so I can see what damage in a biological home can do is that it, it, you're creating an atmosphere where um, LGBTQ individuals could be at, at, in real risk and real harm. Um, and so really dig into those stories, listen to people around you, listening to individuals that we've had the power of, of have the ability to sit down and talk to about what technology has meant for them, access to that technology, even if it was limited, um, having access to a, a librarian or a computer lab at a library, um, being able to find information about their own sexuality because a lot of times they couldn't talk about it in their own biological home. And then all maybe the data trail they left you know, behind as they were going through those explorations. Um, Keeping that in mind as we're thinking about this comprehensive privacy legislation going forward, we're thinking about how people are protected and not protected. There's a lot to this. And the people who have the most work to do are the people that look like me, um, because we have not suffered in the same way that so many of our LGBTQ family members across the country and around the world have and are suffering. Um, and so uh, we really need to take that all into account as we as we continue this journey, as we continue this research, um, and as we continue to support not only our communities, but also the other marginalized communities um, that this may impact. So we have just over five minutes. And as we wrap up, um, the report mentioned several times that itself, it's several pages um, is, is meant to be just the beginning of a longer conversation. Um, something that both of you have, have mentioned um, during this chat in different ways. What comes next? We might have some researchers or nonprofit folks or companies that want to engage in this um, area listening in. Um, what is What do you think might be a good next step for people who want to engage? So I'm a policy wonk. I would be, you know, uh, com completely uh, off the rails if I didn't mention legislation. I know, Chris, you mentioned comprehensive uh, consumer privacy legislation, such it's being debated today. Um, we talked about the risks that consumers face when it comes to the misuse or the insecure use of their data. So I think practices like these really underline that the U.S. needs a comprehensive consumer or federal privacy law. It needs it now. Um, and that law should establish baseline protections for all individuals, including a universal set of rights that would apply to anyone covered under the bill, especially LGBTQ individuals who, who suffer these disparate harms. That law could rein in a lot of these harmful practices and ensure that people understand how their data is collected, used, and stored, and even shared, and that they do have meaningful control over their data. Um, 
also to, um, in addition to consumer privacy law, surveillance reform is critical to addressing a lot of the issues we discussed. Um, we shop online today, we speak to our friends, our loved ones, we explore our sexuality, we meet our partners online. It's important that we're able to do that without fear, without being chilled. We used to keep all this information in our homes, in our in our desks, in our bedrooms. We can't do that anymore. It's, it's digitally recorded. That means that the laws that protect us, that enshrine and due process, user notice, rule of law, those all need to be updated alongside this digitalization process. Um, and then two, just outside of the legislative space, we mentioned the need for, for research. We leaned on so many fantastic experts and advocates for this report. They need more support. Um, they need more focus here um, than ever. I agree with everything that you said. And I know that I've said it several times, but I just, I. I, I will underscore that and say, yes, absolutely. And then on the flip side of that is education for our communities and education for those individuals using the technology. So if you're a company and you're producing the technology, you should have a core portion of your business built in to help train individuals using your technology, how to protect themselves and what safety measures are because across the internet, across getting online, those things are, are crucial and important. And then also for uh, NGOs, uh, you know, you know state-run programs, um, we should be teaching some of our most marginalized and most impacted communities about their safety, about their safety online, about what is being collected, how it's being collected, um, and how they can go ahead, you know, go about protecting themselves. Um, especially as some of these things go into place, if we do get laws passed and we do, then then we need to make sure that people understand their rights in the most basic form and not legal language. Um, because that is where individuals can then empower themselves to take control of their data, take control of, of the information that's out there about them um, and protect themselves in ways that those are across across the country and potentially around the world. So um, I, I just really underscore the education component, uh, which can take multiple facets. Uh, but I think first and foremost, we need to get these laws passed. We need to make sure that uh, something is enshrined because I think we're ending up with a patchwork of, of laws that is going to become troublesome uh, really soon. So. So we have just about a minute left, and I want to raise this question from James, um, who goes back to my um, point about you having nothing to hide and says, is there something you would say to individuals who think that their privacy is already gone, and maybe the only way to maintain it is going off the grid, um, and that that might be a particularly pervasive viewpoint amongst queer youth? I want to ask you in 30 seconds or less, both of you, is there a positive message to give to individuals who really need to maybe hear it? right now um, to wrap us up. Yeah, um, I hear that privacy is dead all the time. Uh, even if you believe that's true, it can always be resurrected. Um, I'm not sure about going off the grid. I think it's frankly today impossible um, for youth and for all of us, especially during the pandemic, we've had to use um, social media platforms to keep up with our families. We've had to to chat with them over our apps. We've had to place calls. We have to access local resources um, over video chat or even engage in this call. Today, I had to use video chat. Um, so if going off the grid isn't possible, especially not possible for everyone, we need to look uh, to better solutions. I'll be very quick. Really look at how you're engaging online. And if you're not comfortable in certain ways, then don't engage that way. That's not necessarily going off the grid. That's just self-editing. You can also use various platforms in order to protect your identity. Um, look at uh, look at encryption, look at encryption-based uh, software um, or apps and make sure that you are you know what you're using um, because you can communicate without going completely off the grid. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Caitlin. Thanks to everybody who tuned in. Um, read the report. This has been such a great conversation. I appreciate both of you and your work. Um, keep doing great work. Um, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye.